Welcome to this month's intensive on personal Christian discipleship. Before we start, though, let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Dear Father, we just thank you for this weekend. Uh, we thank you for Dr. Giffrich, who's going to be uh, delivering this to us. We just ask you to keep our minds open, keep our Bibles open, and, and just teach us what you want us to learn. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Looks like everybody has been here before. We all know where the bathrooms are. Some snacks on the table out here. Uh, tomorrow we'll start at 9 a.m. We'll break for lunch. Start again down for sale at break time. Uh, you'll be able to purchase a copy. And if you desire, he might even sign it for you. <laughs> Just a little bit about him. Uh, he's married, been married since uh, 1997, has four children. I think they're all about out of the house now, except for one. We're trying. Yeah. <laughs> and he's been part of the leadership team at Oak Tree Community Church since 1996. And now he's a teaching pastor there. He's been teaching since uh, 2002. He loves teaching. That's what he, he loves most. And education. Currently, he serves at three different schools. Uh, Calvary University in Kansas City, Missouri. Word of Life Bible Institute, which takes them all over the world, uh, but it's out of Pottersville, New York, and he's adjunct professors at both those places. He also serves right here at Tyndale. He's a professor of Bible and theology, covers Bible exposition, systematic theology. He teaches uh, biblical languages, Greek and Hebrew, and he serves as our dean of advising professors. And... Uh, he got his Master's of Theology from us here at Tyndale. And then he's gone on and he's, he's earned two other doctorates, a D-Min and a Ph.D. since then. I think Ph.D. is Calvary? Yeah, that one's not done yet. Oh, it's not done yet. Okay. Working on it. Excuse me. <laughs> he's authored uh, three books that I know of, including the one that's a textbook for this uh, intensive. This is based on biblical discipleship, the path for... Helping People Follow Jesus. Uh, he's contributed chapters in three other books, as well as several journal articles in, in our Journal of Dispensational Theology. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Daniel Gepperts. Mm -hmm. I may have not that. Uh, see, now I don't know what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> Did too, didn't you? There we go. Well, hi there. Hello. Hello. <laughs> All right, see, so on Sunday mornings in, in my church, I, I get up and I, good morning, church. And when they do something like that, we have to reset, start all over, do the whole thing again because I want to make sure people are awake and, you know, paying attention and everything. So I'm not going to say good morning, church, because that's just, you know, weird for 6 o'clock p.m., but I will say again, hi there! Hi there! Hi there. See? That, that's all I'm looking for. I'm so easy to get along with. <laughs> it is a, uh, a privilege to be here, and uh, it's a pleasure. I've been able to be on campus uh, once before, uh, seven years ago, and uh, my brother and I came down here for one of these intensives, and uh, it, was, uh, it was really good to be able to finally put some uh, faces to some of the names. I've, I started my first class with Tyndale in 2005, so I've been part of the overall Tyndale family for 15 years now. And uh, it's, it's a privilege to be able to serve our students online, be able to work with the team here, um, and I uh, got my, my master's degree here, like uh, Leon said, so it's really um, just, it's really good to be here. And I'm glad you're here. And um, uh, just uh, one more bit of housekeeping uh, before we, uh, you know, turn everything on, I think, right? No, we're rolling. Oh, we're rolling. All right, that's fine. Because um, I told you we were going to roll from the very beginning, and then I decided not to. So uh, <laughs> I actually have two books out there. One of them, like Leon said, is Biblical Discipleship. And that is, we're going to be looking at just some of the core components out of that. It's a book that has taken me almost 20 years to write. Uh, discipleship is a has been a big 
part of what I have tried to study and find what does the Bible say about this. Um, I've written on it, studied it, um, taught it, and the people in our church are probably tired of hearing about it <laughs> because it's been such a long time. Uh, but that finally was able, I was able to publish that this year. Um, the other book that's out there is called New Testament Chapter by Chapter. And um, I have the Old Testament version coming hopefully soon. I, I keep saying that and it's not here yet. Um, but New Testament Chapter by Chapter is actually the result of the Tyndale program. Uh, because uh, some of the, the classes that I had to do for uh, my master's degree uh, were called uh, Old Testament and New Testament Introduction. And uh, the syllabus said, write one paragraph for every chapter of you know, the New Testament or the Old Testament. And I don't remember who my advisor was at that time, and I wouldn't say it anyway, I don't want to get him in trouble. Uh, I said, how in the world am I supposed to summarize an entire chapter in one paragraph, when it also says I have to tackle three different issues in each one. I'm like, that, that is, doesn't even make sense. Is it okay if I write more than one paragraph? And he said, yeah, that's fine, whatever. So I ended up writing somewhere between one and two pages, right? not just a paragraph per chapter. And uh, so the book that's out there, New Testament chapter by chapter, is the result of the New Testament introduction classes. And Old Testament chapter by chapter, we are editing right now so that it can go to publication. We have both of those available uh, at some point. Uh, those are both uh, the, the um, Biblical Discipleship retails for 17. New Testament chapter by chapter retails, I think, at 1995. Uh, they're, this weekend, they're both 15. Uh, so if you get it here just this weekend, you get a couple dollars off of them if you're interested. So, with all of that done, biblical discipleship, or personal Christian discipleship. If you had, um, if, well, I was going to say, if you had the opportunity, but you do, so here you go. How would you define discipleship? It's a word we use all the time. Every church talks about it. Every church probably has some kind of program or plan for it, whether they actually do it. it you know, it's on paper somewhere. Discipleship is like the thing, right? So how do we define it? Student. Student. I would say a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session regarding the Bible. Okay, one-on-one -on -one tutoring session regarding the Bible. What else? How do you define disciple? What is discipleship? It's a lifetime of study. A lifetime of study. Okay. You have the two, uh, the, the person, the student, and you have the teacher. You know, the, from the different, the lifetime of study would be from the student's point of view. From the teacher is uh, the willingness to mentor and uh, come alongside and help someone grow. Okay. All right. So now that is the first time that some that you now somebody has broken away from just the student teacher thought. Because so far, three people have said something about student or teaching or learning, and you just threw a new word in there at the end. You said grow. So that that's not necessary. It doesn't fit within the same thing that everybody else would. I mean, it does, but it's not exactly the same thing, right? Right. So that takes that sort of takes us off in a new trajectory, doesn't it? Different, different. You know, because grow um, is not necessarily connected directly to teaching or learning. Um, they're not exclusive, they work together, but it's not like they're exactly the same thing, right? Well, you can teach and have somebody who's learning, but I know a lot of people who study the Bible and don't do much growing. It's true. And it's the, the relationship between the teacher and the student that is what discipleship's about, to me anyway. Uh, if you're just a teacher, you're not discipling, you're teaching. If you're just a student, you're not being a disciple, you're learning. Okay. But you have that relation going on, and you have a person enabling and helping another person to, to grow in his walk. Okay. Become larger than what he is. Okay. All right. Good. Anybody else want to throw out some uh, thoughts here? I think. Were you going to? 
No. no? You were done. Okay. If you flinch, you have to answer. I mean, that's my that's my rule. Don't flinch. Because if you flinch, you're on you're on the hook now. <laughs> I think uh, I think everybody's right. By the way, I just I, I think everybody's right, and uh, as, as as at least a part of it. Um, and yet, the fact that we came up with a couple of different answers shows us that even just within our group here, we don't have a defined uh, explanation or or understanding. And if and if that's true, even with just in our group right here, right now tonight, I just heard a stat that there are 300, roughly, obviously, 325,000 Protestant churches in the United States. 325,000. Now, there's also the statistic that says hundreds of churches close every year in the United States. Um, so do with that what you want. But let's say 325,000. How many different definitions of discipleship do you think there are? <laughs> Over 325,000 churches. And that's just the Protestant churches. Okay, well, we would call maybe Christian churches, broadly speaking, or, or uh, evangelical churches, maybe a little bit narrower. Um, that does not include any Orthodox. That does not include Catholic, or Catholic Catholicism. That does not include other uh, religions that, that would use the term church, right? Jehovah's Witness and Mormons and, and all the other. That's just <coughs> Protestant Christian churches, 325,000. And yet, as I look around, like I said, I've been studying this for a long time. As I look around, as I read books, as I read material, as I listen to pastors and people in these churches, and I ask, you know, so what's discipleship in your church? Or what do you do about discipleship? Um, we hear about programs. We hear about plans. But it's all different, and a lot of times we can't come up to a definition. And I think that is because discipleship is misunderstood frankly i think most christians and and not i want to be careful because it's, it's such a big topic that um you know when somebody comes in and says oh the church has misunderstood this from you know forever i'm going to tell you exactly what it's supposed always be careful that's a red flag right <laughs> for the first time in 2000 years i finally found the answer you got to be careful with that there's a guy on Facebook I'm interacting with, or I stopped interacting with, because that that's his thing, is that God finally revealed to him something that he hasn't told anybody for the past 2,000 years, and he's got the answer, and he's reached out to thousands and thousands of pastors and churches, and for whatever reason, he can't figure it out. They won't listen. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried to give this information to so many pastors, and they won't listen. I said, well, you're throwing us some pretty red, red, big red flags there, buddy. <laughs> You know, when somebody says, I finally got the answer that nobody else has had before, uh, th that's a red flag, right? So I don't want to do that. But at the same time, if there is something that is confusing, if there's something that is such a big deal, and yet we can't seem to agree on what and why and how, you know, maybe it's worth looking from a different perspective. And of course, you know, we'll, we'll look at it from the... Uh, the Bible uh, and, and how it defines per, uh, discipleship for us. Um, some churches will define discipleship as small groups. Some churches will define discipleship as classes, or this is their discipleship program. This is what you know how discipleship works for them. Um, maybe they use spiritual disciplines. You know, if we just do these three things or these couple of things, then that's that's discipleship uh, for us. The the problem is that I don't think any of those are comprehensive enough. I think discipleship is bigger than that. I think it's a big thing. And what we tend to do, and maybe it's just a human thing, maybe it's a Christian thing, I don't know. But I think what we tend to do is we take this big thing and we try to bring it down into a little thing that we can um, package and maybe sell a book. And, you know, I'm guilty of that. That's fine. You know, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe sell a book or a curriculum or, or something and say, 
We've got it. If you buy this, if you do this, if you go here, if you join our club, if you attend our event, it'll be solved. And I don't think it works that way. I, I don't think Christianity works that way, number one. And last I checked, the commission that Jesus gave the church, or he gave to the 11 apostles who would start the church, right, is not go build a church, go start a small group, go have a program, go have an event. The commission is really two words. Make disciples. Which is really interesting because the commission is not do discipleship. The commission is make disciples. And so what we have to this what we have to figure out is before we can define discipleship, we have to define a disciple. Because the short version is discipleship is simply the process of becoming a disciple. And if we don't know what a disciple is biblically, then anything we do about discipleship is going to be off, right? Um, there, uh, in in modern English, let's put it that way, I don't think there is a good word that helps us really expand or understand what discipleship is. Um, like just one word. We'll use discipleship or disciple throughout our, our time together because I don't think there's another good word. Um, because it's, it's, it's more than just being a fan, right? It's, it's more than just being a student, like, like Leon said, you know, and, and we all know this, you know people who, like, they are the smartest people, right? They've studied the Bible, they know so much about the Bible, they can quote, they can, you know, they don't even need a Bible anymore, they're like a walking Bible, and yet, are they Christ-like in any way? You know, you you wonder, does their life have any... Are they following Jesus? Are they learning anything? Or do they just know stuff, right? Knowledge and disciple is not exactly the same thing. So student isn't the best. Um, A few decades ago, probably, apprentice was probably a better word, right? Apprentice was a good word, but... Today, apprentice sort of has some negative connotation, right? You know, an apprentice is a newbie, is a rookie, and that's not exactly what we want to, you know, bring across for disciple, right? So I, I can't think of a better word, so we're just going to stick with disciple. <laughs> you know, that's, that's just what we're going with here. And um, Jesus said, all authority, I'm using the uh, New English translation, so whatever you have, you know, feel free to use your translation. I'm using the New English translation. Um, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Of course, this is Jesus speaking at the end of Matthew 28. And, and I love this. He says, I have all authority, so you go do some work. <laughs> right? There is a, I have all the authority, so here's what I want you to do. And there are some people, I, I, like Leon said, I get to travel and teach outside of the States. And there are some places where they really grab a hold of this. And there's some um, uh, different, uh, uh, call it maybe a stronger word than I want to use, but different subsets of Christianity, where they grab a hold of that word authority and they say, we have all authority to do whatever. And I say, hold on a second. Do we have authority? Or does Jesus have authority? Jesus didn't say, you have all authority in heaven and on earth, so go do these things. He said, I have all authority, so I'm going to commission you with one tiny little slice of my authority. Is that binding and rebuking and casting and healing and all this other stuff that we usually you know, hear authority being claimed for? No. Here's your little slice of the pie. Jesus has all the authority. He can do all the rest of this stuff. He says, here's your slice of the pie. Go make disciples. That's what I want you to do. That's what I want you to spend your life doing. That's what I want you to spend your energy and your time doing, is making disciples. And he says, of, of all, of all uh, nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Of course, um, um, at least in our church, we, when we baptize somebody, we use that sort of like almost a formula type thing. But Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything 
I've commanded you. And we'll come back to that. In Jesus' ministry, Jesus made two calls. And his calls were, number one, come to me. Matthew chapter 11, right? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened. And I will give you, what? Rest. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Because I'm gentle and you know easy and and and, uh, and uh, um, um, I always forget the last. <laughs> uh, um, see now I have to. I, I always try to quote it, and we'll look it up here real quick. It's always better to do that anyway. <clears throat> gentle and humble in heart, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Right. Does that sound like most discipleship programs you've heard? Complicated. Discipleship, we have made discipleship really, really complicated, haven't we? You got to go to classes, you got to do programs, you got to sign up for this event, you got to make sure you go to the men's retreat, you've got to, you know, be in the small group, you've got to do all this stuff, take the classes. Which, by the way, I'm glad for classes. I'm glad you're here tonight. <laughs> you know, if it weren't for classes, none of us would be here tonight, right? But we have made discipleship complicated. What did Jesus say? Come to me and you'll find rest. We have made, and let's, let's make it even bigger, not just discipleship. We've made Christianity a whole lot harder than it's supposed to be. Christianity... I'm not saying it's not complex. I'm not saying there aren't details to it. But I think that we have taken our little slice of the pie, our little piece of what God wants us to do in the overall scheme of what he's doing, and we have turned it into a monster. When Jesus says, come to me and I'll give you rest. We're like, no, 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 come to me and I'm going to load you up with classes and programs and events and all this other stuff to prove how spiritual you are. I don't think Jesus recognizes the discipleship process, the discipleship programs, and the Christianity that we tend to put out there. Now, did Jesus have demands? Did Jesus make demands of his followers? Yes, of course he did. Yeah, absolutely he did. Luke chapter 14, there is a cost to discipleship. Now, by the way, there's not a cost to salvation, not to us, right? There's not a cost for salvation. It costs God, but it doesn't cost us. Salvation is a free gift of God, right? It doesn't cost us anything. In fact, it could, we couldn't pay for it if we wanted to. <laughs> we couldn't possibly. And in chapter 2 of my book, I explain what salvation is. And I list out 17 things. I've always wanted to write a primer on salvation. For the first three chapters, I, I, I give a primer on salvation. What is the pure gospel? What does, the, what, what does salvation include? And, and we do, do just a brief soteriology of 17 things that salvation includes. And I love it because you get to the end, you're like, how could I possibly lose this if this is ever... God would have to undo all 17 of these things for, and then take it away. Which, in most of those, requires going back on his word and his character for us to lose salvation. Man, it is an awesome gift of God. And then chapter 3 is, what is salvation not? But Jesus said, come to me. Let me give you this gift. Let me give you rest. And then we say, great, now you're in. Let's do all this stuff. And we end up with Christians who are genuine believers. I'm not doubting their Christianity. I'm not doubting their salvation. Let me put it that way. But they get burnt out. They get tired. They don't understand why Christianity has to be so hard. And some of them end up walking away because of the burdens that we've placed on them that I don't think Jesus wanted. And so what I'd like to do and what I'm hoping to present over this time together is, is there a different way to accomplish the same thing that we're trying to accomplish? Because I don't say our intentions are bad. We know what we want to accomplish for the most part. 
But is there a different way to approach it? Is there a different mindset that we can put behind it? Is there an example or a pattern that we can use that spans continents and languages and generations that worked back then and still works 2,000 years today? I think there is. And I think that if we do it the way we're going to find in Scripture, at least the way I see it in Scripture, um, I think it ends up being a little bit easier. It's still complex. There are still details. There are still demands. There are still commitments. Discipleship is a commitment. But I think it ends up being more restful and less restless, the way Jesus intended. Jesus' first call was, come to me. His second call then was, now that you've come, I want you to follow me. Right? I want you to follow me. They're two separate calls. Sometimes people put those two things together as if they're the same thing. You have to come and follow all in one shot. And, and I don't find that in Scripture. I don't find that in Jesus' uh, ministry. I don't find that in, um, uh, in, in the, the, the apostles' ministry. Um, and I think part of the problem that we have is that we confuse them. We put them all together as if coming and following uh, have to be part of the same thing. And d whereas disciple, whereas uh, salvation rather is a one-time event, right? Justification. I mean, it's a process. We were saved, are being saved, and will be saved. You know the different aspects of it. But salvation itself is a is a package deal. We are saved. We are saved forever. Discipleship doesn't work that way. Discipleship is a process. It's uh, in fact, it's a lifelong process. We never get done. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I would love it if we did. In fact, I'm going to show you a checklist that is not a checklist, and I wish it were because I love checklists, right? But we've turned disciple. That's one of the things we, we've done with discipleship is we've turned it into checklists. If you do these three things and then, you know, you know turn around and sit down, then everything is, uh, you know, fine. All right, check, 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 check. Perfect. And it doesn't work that way. Um, and, uh, one of the terms that we use in the seminary, of course, and you hear it in church as well, I'm sure, is progressive sanctification, right? Uh, I think that's a pretty good synonym for discipleship, at least for the discipleship process. And progressive sanctification basically is bad news. You think it's good news because you think that progressive sanctification says you're getting better, and that's true. There is that good news in it. But the bad news is you're never done until you're dead. Who wants that? <laughs> right? Who wants to sign up for a lifetime of, I have to get better. 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 I'm not good enough yet. Well, I'm not sure that's the way the Bible presents it, but that's sometimes how we sell it. And we wonder why people walk away or run away, depending. And my guess is that you know somebody, maybe friends or family, maybe a neighbor's kid, maybe your own children or grandchildren, who, maybe yourself at one time, who got burnt out on church and burnt out on Christianity and burnt out on programs and burnt out on all this other stuff, and you or they walked or ran as fast as you could to get away from it because that's it was just too much. And I don't think it has to be that way. Jesus didn't chase people away. He told them the truth and he said, come to me, I'll give you rest, and now follow me. And yes, there is a commitment. But what I find is that the people who did not follow him right away, he still let hang around. He didn't say, if you don't follow me, you can't be with me anymore. You can't come to me anymore. He said, come and join me. Come and join. Listen. Now, do you want to take the next step of commitment? You want to follow me too? Oh, no, I don't want to follow you. That's all right. That's all right. Stay here. Spend some extra time here. At some point, I want you to follow me, but I'm not going to force the issue. It's two different calls, two different levels of commitment. And it's very possible that even in this room and those who are listening later have done one and yet not the other. And what I'm saying is 
Today, that's okay. That's okay. Because it's a process. And sometimes we push people into the process before they're ready to be a part of the process. And as we get into this, especially tomorrow, I'll show you why I think that's true. I think that there are people who are genuinely saved, genuinely believers, who never grow up. Right? See, we look at their lives and we say, you can't possibly be saved because I don't see any fruit in your life. When people tell me that, one of my questions, not always, but one of my questions is, who uh, gave you authority as fruit inspector, right? <laughs> who, who says that you have to be fruitful to my standards? Right? According to John 15, Jesus said, I'm the true vine, you are the branches, and you fill in the blank, is the gardener. Who's the gardener? According to John 15. Do you remember? The Father is the gardener. And because the Father is the gardener, the Father gets to determine what fruit he plants and how much fruit he considers fruitful in any given season. We spend our time running around looking at everybody else trying to decide if they're fruitful or not according to our standards, and we're trying to do the Father's work, and Jesus said, hold on a second, you're just a branch. <laughs> you're not a gardener. You don't know anything about gardening. You barely bear fruit yourself, according to my standards. How about if maybe we work on you instead of you working on somebody else? One of my favorite stories, I was talking to uh, a friend of mine uh, in Uganda, one of the places I get to teach, um, and in fact, this weekend, I'm supposed to be leaving for Uganda, and every school in the country is closed, so I don't get to go teach there this, this I have to wait till next year. But I'm supposed to be leaving, uh, I was supposed to be there for the next two weeks. And uh, on, the, on the Word of Life campus in, in uh, Uganda, they have some, these beautiful mango trees. And uh, um, I, I was talking with a friend of mine there, and he was, he was getting ready to teach as a devotional for some uh, youth event, John 15, right? I'm the vine, you're the branches, and he's going off on all this stuff. And, you know, we got to be fruitful, and we got to do all this stuff, and he's, you know, focused on the fruitful, fruitful, fruitful. I'm like, why are you so, why, why are you so focused on that? That's not even the main point of the whole thing, which, of course, you know, stopped him in his tracks. He's like, what? <laughs> I thought this word about, you know, fruit and more fruit, much fruit and eternal fruit and, you know, fruit, 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 you know, like, you see those, ma those mango trees over there, right? Yeah. He said, let's say, and I didn't count them. I said, let's say that the, the one on the left there, now these first two here, the one on the left has 100 mangoes on it. And the one on the right has 50 mangoes on it. Can I use this whiteboard? Sure can. All right. Because it makes sense in my head, but then people always. So I've got a tree here that has 100. I'm not going to try to draw a tree. And, and the one over here has 50 mangoes on it, okay? Which one is more fruitful? <laughs> See, you're, 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 but which one is more fruitful? Because when we look at each other, we don't say, oh, we're all bearing fruit. We say, you're more fruitful than you are. This person is more fruitful, and I'm more fruitful, and you're more... So which one, just looking at the tree, 100 mangoes, 50 mangoes, which one is more fruitful? 100, right? Absolutely. That's exactly what we would say. Until the gardener wanders by and overhears our little conversation about fruitfulness. And he says, let me add a bit of information for you. The left tree last season had 200 mangoes. And the right tree last season had 25 mangoes. Now, which one is more fruitful? <laughs> the one on the right is more fruitful. Because even if this season it has fewer mangoes on the tree, it's actually growing and this one's dying. 
It went from 200 to 100. It cut it, its produce in half, whereas this one doubled. See, the problem that we have with most of our discipleship processes and programs and all this stuff is that we look at today's snapshot and make a decision on who's being fruitful and who's not. And honestly, if I can be a five-year-old, that's not fair. <laughs> that's not fair. That's not fair to anybody. Because we have no idea what last season looked like. We have no idea what's going on inside the tree that is eating it alive right now. Physically or spiritually or emotionally or mentally. We have no idea what's going on inside of a person. And yet we say, look, you've got a hundred mangoes. You're so spiritual. You're so you know, awesome. You're doing all this stuff. Why can't you be more like 100? You only have 50. And this person has doubled in their spiritual growth over the last year, but we compare each other to each other, just like Paul said not to do in 1 Corinthians. I don't think this is the way it's supposed to be. I think there has to be a better way to define fruitfulness or discipleship or growth or whatever term you want to use. I think there has to be a better way. Now, what I'm not saying is we don't have the right to make these determinations because if we're supposed to make disciples then somehow we have to see we have to evaluate right we have to see if we are moving forward if we're making progress you know we jesus can't say go make disciples and we're like you know okay what's that look like don't worry about it i mean there's got to be some kind of evaluation right and we're going to look at uh, several passages over our time together that will help lay this out i'm just trying to set up right here at the beginning that the model that we typically use is at least flawed if not broken can we at least agree that even if it's not completely broken can we at least agree it's got some flaws and maybe there can be a better way to do what god is trying to do so here's my here's my definition of a disciple i'm going to give you this definition this is the one that's that's in the book, you can write it down here. This is the one that we're going to work off of. And that is, and we'll, we'll, we'll tear it apart for a little bit here. A disciple is a person who places himself or herself under the instruction of an expert or teacher, or master rather is the term I used, with the goal of becoming like the one they are following. Okay? Now, this is my definition. You may have a better definition, that's fine. This one's mine. <laughs> this is the one that we're going to work on for a little bit. A disciple is a person who places himself or herself under the instruction of an expert or a master with the goal of becoming like the one they are following. Okay? There are four parts to this. All right? And I'm going to go ahead and switch slides, and the whole thing will be up there. I'm just going to be highlighting them, so if you're still writing, don't be afraid. It'll, it'll, we'll still get this down. Okay. Number one, aspect number one, as we define discipleship or disciple, is that discipleship occurs on a person. Discipleship happens to a person. Now, that sounds like a really stupid statement. Of course it happens to a person. And yet, I don't think it's a stupid statement because most of what we talk about when we talk about discipleship is not people, it's groups, isn't it? We have discipleship groups and classes and programs and all this. And we, we stop talking about discipleship or disciples as people, individuals, and we talk about them as groups. But the Bible doesn't present anything that says that discipleship is a group thing or even can, uh, um, um, it can happen in groups but only on individual people. You can't disciple a group. A group can't be discipled. A person can be discipled. Men and women and children can be discipled, but groups can't be discipled. Groups can help create environments for discipleship, but a group can't be discipled. Um, because discipleship happens at the individual level. Right? Jesus said, go make disciples, not go make small groups. So we get to get what we're doing right here, right now, 
with those of us in this room is not discipleship. It's teaching. It's instruction. I hope that there will be some conversation. I don't want this to be, you know, nine hours or ten hours or whatever. It's going to be a monologue, and you don't want that either. Okay? So I hope that there's going to be some discussion and some questions and some feedback here. But that doesn't make discipleship either. Having coffee and cookies and donuts and, you know, snacks and everything, fellowship, you know, a.k.a. fellowship, right? Coffee and food equals fellowship, right? <laughs> I'm okay with that definition of fellowship. I'm not okay with calling that discipleship. Because it's not, right? If we get together in a little circle and we pray for each other and we read the Bible, that's a great time of prayer and Bible. It's not discipleship. Discipleship is bigger than that. Okay, we keep narrowing it down and making it complex, and I think the Bible presents a different picture. Because you can't disciple a group of people. We have discipleship groups where one person stands up here and teaches. It's not discipleship. It's teaching. It could be very, very good teaching. It could be very bad teaching. It doesn't matter. It's not discipleship. Okay. Because discipleship happens to a person. Number two. It's a person specifically who places himself or her herself under instruction. A disciple is a person who places himself or herself under instruction. So there's two parts of this. First of all, you cannot disciple a person who doesn't want to be discipled. Discipleship cannot be forced. You cannot, I mean, you can drag them to a group, but we've already said that's not discipleship, right? The person has to actively, intentionally, willfully, willingly place themselves under the instruction. If they're not there willingly, if they're not there because they want to, if they're not there with intention, discipleship isn't happening. Okay? They have to want to. And it does have, and this is where you guys brought this up earlier on, it does have to do with some kind of instruction. There does have to be instruction. In fact, the, uh, and this is where you got your, your um, uh, definition before. Uh, the, the Greek word translated make disciples there comes from the, uh, the, um, the root of manthano, okay? And mathe, mathe tes is the, the Greek word, and it simply means student or learner or pupil, okay? But there's more to it than that because what we think of as student or learner or pupil in the United States of America in the 21st century is vastly different than what student or pupil or learner looked and felt like in the first century when this was written and spoken. When somebody said disciple back then, that was more like apprenticeship than what we think of disciple today. Today we think of disciple as somebody who comes to class and you know, you know, has fellowship because we had coffee. <laughs> That's not disciple. It's different, right? So this is a person who is there for instruction, who wants to be there, who willingly places themselves under this instruction, number three, of an expert or master. A disciple is not made by a novice. Okay? Um... I think one of the, <laughs> I might get into trouble with this, and that's okay. I've been in trouble before, and feel free to throw things at me and disagree with me. That's perfectly fine. Um, I think <clears throat> one of the downsides of what many of our discipleship programs look like is somebody gets saved, and the first thing we do is throw them out to the wolves and say, now go share your faith. Now, I know that there are a lot of programs out there that, that say, you know, every Christian is supposed to be sharing their faith from day one. How else are we supposed to make converts? Last I checked, the commission wasn't make converts. The, co the commission was make disciples, right? And this person is saved, and they're excited, and you want to use that excitement. You don't want it to flame out, and so you throw them out there and say, go share your faith. What did Jesus do for you? And they get shredded by the world because the world has a whole lot more practice at that than they do because they've been saved for 13 minutes. Right? And they come back with their tail between their legs and the best thing that we have to offer them is, yep, it's a rough world out there, isn't it? 
Keep trying. Go get beat up again. I'm not sure that's the way it's supposed to be. Now, you might disagree with that, and that's fine. <laughs> Where's the rest in that? Where's the rest? Yeah. Yeah, I will give you rest for the first 13 minutes. Now go out there and get into battle. <laughs> Even the Israelites didn't have to go back go to battle for the first year of marriage, right? <laughs> you know, they got some time. But we're like, yes, you're saved. Now you got to go get all your friends saved too. They barely know what happened to them. Well, just tell your testimony. Tell your story. I'm not sure that's the way it's supposed to be. Again, if you disagree, that's fine. That's fine. Maybe you were saved because a friend of yours went to church, heard the gospel, went to a crusade, an event, heard the gospel, came, grabbed you, and pulled you into the same thing, and you were saved. Absolutely awesome. That is, I love it. I love hearing stuff like that. I think that's the exception, not the norm. That's all I'm saying. I think it's the exception. Because there has, and, and, and that's salvation, not discipleship, but discipleship requires instruction, like you said, under or at the feet of an expert or master. And now to all of us pastors and teachers in the room, here's a little thing for us. We are not the experts or the masters. Sometimes pastors and teachers get a complex and think that we are the experts that everybody has to be learning from and the masters. We're not. We're on the discipleship path just like everybody else. We may be further along the path than other people are. In fact, if you're on the path at all, and we're going to start this, the path uh, tonight, if you're on the path at all, if you're on the discipleship path, then you are further along than somebody else. You, just by the nature of things, you are. But you're also behind other people. And pastors and teachers are behind other people too. We cannot ever... Those of us who have a microphone, who have a podium, who are up here, you know, you know, super awesome PowerPoints and the whole thing, <laughs> we're not the experts. We're not the masters. We're not the one that we want people following. That's Jesus. He is the expert. He is the teacher. He is the master. He uses human agents to help, but he also uses non-human agents, like, for instance, let's say, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> who does a better job than the rest of us combined, right? Sometimes we forget that we're not the expert or the master that we want people following. Do we want our churches to grow? Of course we do. We want more people in our churches. We want more people at our events and our programs. Of course we do. That's natural. But that doesn't make us the expert that we want people following. If we're not pointing people to Jesus, either for salvation or for discipleship, then that's not discipleship, not biblical discipleship anyway. Because Jesus is the expert. He's the master. And finally, a disciple is a person who places himself or herself under the instruction of an expert or master, number four, with the goal of becoming like the one they are following. Discipleship has a very specific goal or destination. It's not open-ended. It's not, well, you know, as long as you get in, you can do anything you want, and, you know, we'll eventually get there, and, you know, Jesus will say, hey, good job, come on in. There's a process, there is a goal, there is a destination that the Scriptures lay out for us, and I call it the path because it's so creative. <laughs> and if we walk that path, we will find our destination, and if we don't walk that path, we will not find our destination. That's really what it comes down to. It has to have a definite or defined goal or destination. I think it's probably a good place to break for this, this, uh, this first session, and we'll come back and we'll start talking about what that goal is, what that destination is. Yes, sir. I wanted to comment on something that okay. you said a while ago about you said progressive sanctification. Yeah. Uh, another term that I learned same thing experiential sanctification okay uh, I think Andy Woods uses the term or has used the term lordship sanctification okay yeah uh, you'll understand a little bit whenever I say that I've been studying the book of Job for some time <laughs> and that I when you were talking about that a while ago I was thinking about uh, discipleship what what 
what's happened to discipleship is it's turned into uh, suffering discipleship. That's yes. what I see. Yeah, that's, and, and I would say that it's like anything else. If there's one right way, which I think there is a right way because, and I'm going to try to prove that from the scriptures, right? If there is a right way, that means there's an infinite number of wrong ways, right? We see that with salvation. Jesus is the only way, right? Which means that there's an infinite number of wrong ways. So if we don't get discipleship right, it can be suffering discipleship. It can be anything else that is not the way it's designed to be. Uh, lordship, discipleship, uh, that term is used to try to play off of lordship salvation, right? It's, it's, it's not lordship salvation. It is lordship discipleship. I get the point. Um, I, I tend to think that can confuse people, and so I try to stay away from it. I, I understand why they want to do it, because they're trying to make a clear, clear distinction. I think they end up failing making a clear distinction by making it sound too similar. And then it's just like, well, but... I thought lordship was, you know, good or bad or whatever. Well, not, not lordship sanctification, is it? Well, how is that different? And then we just have to explain it anyway, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer in let, try to use whatever terminology makes the most sense up front and then uh, build out the explanation on it. But, I, I, I mean, it's true. I mean, I agree with it. It's true because sanctification is coming under the lordship of Christ. So, I get that. Yeah. Good. Okay? All right. Uh, let's take a break until okay. whatever. 10 minutes.